Hello and welcome to another episode of Pulp Today. I'm your host, David Avaloni, recording from a door, from right near a door that goes to my balcony where the bird feeders are. So I hope you enjoy the sound of birds. Uh, you've probably noticed them in previous episodes if this isn't your first time. And if it's your first time, welcome. Pause to take a sip for the uh, the audio listeners. Hello, iTunes. Mm. I'm like 70-something episodes in, and, and there are still favorite books and favorite authors of mine I haven't gotten to. And today we're going to get to Paul Auster. And in particular, the New York Trilogy. Uh, might have been the first Auster I read. It was introduced to me by a friend named Rachel Toll, uh, a classmate from Bard, and uh, knew it would be my kind of thing, and she was 100% right. And uh, it's interesting for this series because while uh, I always talk about how pulp is a description of the paper it was printed on and everything from high art to low entertainment to lo high entertainment to low art can be uh, printed on cheap paper. So basically anything that's paperback uh, applies. But Auster's uh, New York Trilogy is absolutely high-toned art about pulp subjects, which is one of my favorite classifications. It also goes along with uh, some previous episodes subjects. It is the same kind of literary fun and games as uh, Calvino's If on a Winter, Winter Night a Traveler. It has the same sort of breaking of reality and fourth walls that you might find in Phil, Philip K. Dick's Vallis. I consider it very much of a piece with those books. And I'm going to read a relatively large section of it because the opening paragraph, the opening nine pages uh, of the New York trilogy, the first story is City of Glass, followed by Ghosts, followed by The Locked Room. They are connected but not connected in fascinating ways. As I was saying, the first pages of City of Glass are about a writer who writes detective novels and the way in which Auster deals with all of the doubling of identities in the character you write and maybe the pseudonym under which you write the character is particularly fascinating and his perspective on the detective novel specifically is, is really great. So here we go, a, a pretty long section of City of Glass, the first part, the first novella in the New York Trilogy. One. It was a wrong number that started it, the telephone ringing three times in the dead of night, and the voice at the other end asking for someone he was not. Much later, when he was able to talk, think about the things that happened to him, he would conclude that nothing was real except chance. But that was much later. In the beginning, there was simply the event and its consequences. Whether it might have turned out differently, or whether it was all predetermined was with the first word that came out of the stranger's mouth, it's not the question. The question is the story itself, and whether or not it means something is not for the story to tell. As for Quinn, there is little that need detain us. Who he was, where he came from, and what he did are of no great importance. We know, for example, that he was 35 years old. We know that he had once been married and had once been a father, and that both his wife and son were now dead. We also know that he wrote books. To be precise, we know that he wrote mystery novels. These works were written under the name of William Wilson, and he produced them at a rate of about one a year, which brought in enough money for him to live modestly in a small New York apartment. Because he spent no more than five or six months on a novel, for the rest of the year he was free to do as he wished. He read many books, he looked at paintings, he went to the movies. In the summer he watched baseball on television, in the winter he went to the opera. More than anything, more than anything else, however, what he liked to do was walk. Nearly every day, rain or shine, hot or cold, he would leave his apartment to walk through the city, never really going anywhere, but simply going wherever his legs seemed to take him. New York was an inexhaustible space, a labyrinth of endless steps, and no matter how far he walked, no matter how well he came to know its neighborhoods and streets, it always left him with the feeling of being lost. Lost not only in the city, but within himself as well. Each time he took a walk, he felt as though he were leaving himself behind, and by giving himself up to the movement of the streets, by reducing himself to the seeing eye, he was able to escape the obligation to think. And this, more than anything else, brought him a measure of peace, a salutary emptiness within. 
The world was outside of him, around him, before him, and the speed with which it kept changing made it impossible for him to dwell on any one thing for very long. Motion was of the essence, the act of putting one foot in front of the other and allowing himself to follow the drift of his own body. By wandering aimlessly, all places became equal, and it no longer mattered where he was. On his best walks, he was able to feel that he was nowhere, and this, finally, was all he ever asked of things, to be nowhere. New York was the nowhere he had built around himself, and he realized that he had no intention of ever leaving it again. In the past, Quinn had been more ambitious. As a young man, he had published several books of poetry, had written plays, critical essays, and had worked on a number of long translations. But quite abruptly, he had given up all that. A part of him had died, he told his friends, and he did not want it coming back to haunt him. It was then that he had taken on the name of William Wilson. Quinn was no longer that part of him that could write books, and although in many ways Quinn continued to exist, he no longer existed for anyone but himself. He had continued to write because it was the only thing he felt he could do. Mystery novels seemed a reasonable solution. He had little trouble inventing the intricate stories they required, and he wrote well, often in spite of himself, as if without having to make an effort. Because he did not consider himself to be the author of what he wrote, he did not feel responsible for it, and therefore was not compelled to defend it in his heart. William Wilson, after all, was an invention, and even though he had been born within Quinn himself, he now led an independent life. Quinn treated him with deference, at times even admiration, but he never went so far as to believe that he and William Wilson were the same man. It was for this reason that he did not emerge from behind the mask of his pseudonym. He had an agent, but they had never met. Their contacts were confined to the mail, for which purpose Quinn had rented a numbered box at the post office. Same was true of his publisher, who paid all fees, monies, and royalties to Quinn through the agent. No book by William Wilson ever included an author's photograph or biographical note. William Wilson was not listed in any writer's directory, he did not give interviews, and all the letters he received were answered by his agent's secretary. As far as Quinn could tell, no one knew his secret. In the beginning, when his friends learned that he had given up writing, they would ask him how he was planning to live. He told them all the same thing, that he had inherited a trust fund from his wife. But the fact was that his wife had never had any money, and the fact was that he no longer had any friends. It had been more than five years now. He did not think about his son very much anymore. Only recently he had removed the photograph his wife, of his wife from the wall. Every once in a while he would suddenly feel what it had been like to hold the thirteen-year-old, the three-year-old boy in his arms. But that was not exactly thinking, nor was it even remembering. It was a physical sensation, an imprint of the past that had been left in his body, and he had no control over it. These moments came less often now, and for the most part it seemed as though things had begun to change for him. He no longer wished to be dead. At the same time, it cannot be said that he was glad to be alive. But at least he did not resent it. He was alive, and the stubbornness of this fact had little by little begun to fascinate him, as if he had managed to outlive himself, as if he were somehow living a posthumous life. He did not sleep with the lamp on any more, and for many months now he had not remembered any of his dreams. It was night. Quinn lay smoking lay in bed smoking a cigarette, listening to the rain beat against the window. He wondered when it would stop and whether he would feel like taking a long walk or a short walk in the morning. An open copy of Marco Polo's Travels lay face down on the pillow beside him. Since finishing the latest William Wilson novel two weeks earlier, he had been languishing. His private eye narrator, Max Work, had solved an elaborate series of crimes, had suffered through a number of beatings and narrow escapes, and Quinn was feeling somewhat exhausted by his efforts. Over the years, Work had become very close to Quinn. Whereas William Wilson remained an abstract figure for him, Work had increasingly come to life. In the triad of selves that Quinn had become, Wilson served as a kind of ventriloquist. Quinn himself was the dummy, and Work was the animated voice that gave purpose to the Enterprise. If Wilson was an illusion, he nevertheless justified the lives of the other two. If Wilson did not exist, he nevertheless was the bridge that allowed Quinn to pass from himself into work. And little by little, work had become a presence in Quinn's life, his interior brother, his comrade in solitude. Quinn picked up the Marco Polo and started reading the first page again. We will set down things seen as seen, things heard as heard, so that our book may be an accurate record, free from any sort of fabrication. And all who read this book or hear it may do so with full confidence, because it contains nothing but the truth. 
just as Quinn was beginning to ponder the meaning of these sentences, to turn their crisp assurances over in his mind, the telephone rang. Much later, when he was able to reconstruct the events, the events of that night, he would remember looking at the clock, seeing that it was past twelve, and wondering why someone should be calling him at that hour. More than likely, he thought it was bad news. He climbed out of bed, walked naked to the telephone, and picked up the receiver on the second ring. Yes? There was a long pause on the other end, and for a moment Quinn thought the caller had hung up. Then, as if from a great distance, there came the sound of a voice unlike any he had ever heard. It was at once mechanical and filled with feeling, hardly more than a whisper and yet perfectly audible, and so even in tone that he was unable to tell if it belonged to a man or a woman. Hello, said the voice. Who is this? asked Quinn. Hello, said the voice again. I'm listening, and said Quinn. Who is this? Is this Paul Oster? asked the voice. I would like to speak to Mr. Paul Oster. There is no one here by that name. Paul Oster, of the Oster Detective Agency. I'm sorry, said Quinn. You must have the wrong number. This is a matter of utmost urgency, said the voice. There's nothing I can do for you, said Quinn. There is no Paul Oster here. You don't understand, said the voice. Time is running out. Then I suggest you dial again. This is not a detective agency. Quinn hung up the phone. He stood there on the cold floor, looking down at his feet, his knees, his limp penis. For a brief moment he regretted having been so abrupt with the calder. It might have been a little might have been interesting, he thought, to have played along with him a little. Perhaps he could have found out something about the case, perhaps even have helped in some way. I must learn to think more quickly on my feet, he said to himself. Like most people, Quinn knew almost nothing about crime. He had never murdered anyone, he had never stolen anything, and he did not know anyone who had. He had never been inside a police station, had never met a private detective, had never spoken to a criminal. Whatever he knew about these things, he had learned from books, films, and newspapers. He did not, however, consider this to be a handicap. What interested him about the stories he, he wrote was not their relation to the world, but their relation to other stories. Even before he became William Wilson... Quinn had been a devoted reader of mystery novels. He knew that most of them were poorly written, that most could not stand up to even the vaguest sort of examination, but still, it was the form that appealed to him, and it was the rare, unspeakably bad mystery that he would refuse to read. Whereas his taste in other books was rigorous, demanding to the point of narrow-mindedness, with these works, he showed almost no discrimination whatsoever. When he was in the right mood, he had a little trouble reading ten or he had little trouble reading ten or twelve of them in a row. It was a kind of hunger that took hold of him, hold of him, a craving for a special food, and he would not stop until he had eaten his fill. What he liked about these books was their sense of plenitude and economy. In the good mystery, there is nothing wasted, no sentence, no word that is not significant, and even if it is not significant, it has the potential to be so, which amounts to the same thing. The world of the book comes to life seething with possibilities, with secrets and contradictions. Since everything seen or said, even the slightest, most trivial, trivial thing, can bear a connection to the outcome of the story. Nothing must be overlooked. Let me say that again. Since everything seen or said, even the slightest, most trivial thing, can bear a connection to the outcome of the story, nothing must be overlooked. Everything becomes essence. The center of the book shifts with each event that propels it forward. The center, then, is everywhere, and no circumference can be drawn until the book has come to its end. The detective is one who looks, who listens, who moves through this morass of objects and events in search of the thought, the idea that will pull all the things together and make sense of them. In effect, the writer and the detective are interchangeable. The reader sees the world through the detective's eyes, experiencing the proliferation of its details as if for the first time. He has become awake to the things around him, as if they might speak to him, as if, because of the attentiveness he now brings to them, they might begin to carry a meaning other than the simple fact of their existence. Private I. The term held a triple meaning for Quinn. Not only was it the letter I, standing for investigator, it was I in the upper case, the tiny life bud buried in the body of the breathing, breathing self. At the same time, it was also the physical I of the writer, the I of the man who looks out f from himself into the world and demands that the world re reveal itself to him. For five years now, Quinn had been living in the grip of this pun. He had, of course, long ago stopped thinking about himself as real, if he lived now in the world at all, it was only at one remove, through the imaginary person of Mac's work. 
His detective necessarily had to be real. The nature of the books demanded it. If Quinn had allowed himself to vanish, to withdraw into the confines of a strange and hermetic life, work continued to live in the world of others. And the more Quinn seemed to vanish, the more persistent work's presence in that wor world became. Whereas Quinn tended to feel out of place in his own skin, work was aggressive, quick-tongued, at home in whatever spot he happened to find himself. The very things that caused problems for Quinn, work took for granted, and he worked through. He walked through that mayhem of his adventures with an ease and indifference that never failed to impress his creator. It was not precisely that Quinn wanted to be work, or even be like him, but it reassured him to pretend to be work as he was writing the, his books. To know that he had it in him to be work, even if he never chose to be, even if it was only in his mind. That night, as he at last drifted off to sleep, Quinn tried to imagine what work would have said to the stranger on the phone. In his dream, which he later forgot, he found himself alone in a room, firing a pistol into a blank, bare wall. I mean, come on, that's pretty great, right? Now you're going to run out and buy that book. A few things that are you just got to draw attention to. The writer, Quinn, creates a pseudonym, William Wilson. William Wilson is, of course, the name of the main, the title character of an Edgar Allan Poe story, a man who is chased through his own life by a doppelganger, another version of him who literally haunts him. Auster says he was haunting himself. He would not, he did not want to be haunted by himself. Um, so that's William Wilson. I love the b absolute boldness and baldness of the symbolism of calling the detective character work. What is the, your main character but the work of the writer? He's max work. He is the maximum amount of work that Quinn is able to do. And then, of course, you get the very Philip K. Dick, very Italo Calvino. Is Paul Auster there? says a character in a Paul Auster novel talking to a character who is a writer in a novel by Paul Auster writing. I mean, that's... Those kind of games go back very, very far. Uh, and also, he quotes from the opening of Marco Polo's book, which asserts its truthfulness. And of course, Marco Polo was a champion liar who made up a lot of things who, uh, like present-day urban legends and and uh, conspiracy theories repeated things other people had told him as though they had happened to him. Um, so it's a very dense book. There, there's, there's no even those nine pages I just read you would take a long time to dissect and talk about every beautiful instance of mirroring and of self-examination and of the creation of shadow selves and masks behind which you can hide or masks that you can create to absolutely show the real you. Fun stuff. You know, I usually have talked about, I don't know how often I've actually read something from a living author. So Paul, if you ever listen, sorry, man, I tried to do some justice. Mm. I should mention in passing, there is a graphic novel adaptation of City of Glass uh, by... Paul Karasik and uh, David Mazzicelli, amazing artist, and uh, it's very good, but boy, it's hard to beat the music of Paul Auster's writing with any visuals, no matter how fantastic. Uh, the book stands alone as, an, as a, as a tr tremendous achievement. And again, I talk about this a lot, I think, but I, this is a good opportunity to hammer it again. People look down on genre. But I would argue genre is the best vehicle for writing about the real world as it really is. The example I always use is you write about a man confronting his demons in the prosaic real world way. And people get it and they love it and it can be a masterpiece. Or you can write about him struggling with actual demons metaphorically. And the thing about human life is that feels that can feel every bit as real to the reader. Someone can read something about ghosts, about detectives, about murderers, about galactic empires, and still think, this is about me. I see myself in that detective, in that 
vampire in that Jedi Knight, whatever, whatever mask you choose to put on the human face. And with that, I bid you adieu until the next exciting episode. My French is lousy. Have a good one.